You should add simple, complicated, or complex questions are yes. welcome. I know it's an awful lot to absorb in one sitting. Yep. Uh, I'm Dennis Opero with the Institute's Assessment Office. Um, when I was looking at your the final slides in the management uh, uh, approach and so on, one thing that struck me is that uh, developing, a, I guess, a scenario or um, uh, to go with, uh, might, it might be hard to bring along some stakeholders who feel they have to make uh, a lot of sacrifices to, to go with that scenario. If, if I'm thinking we're to address climate change, we're going to reduce fossil fuel consumption, and uh, petroleum companies may not may not like that scenario. Yep. And uh, so they would do everything they can to convince us that we shouldn't try that one. I uh, agree. How, I mean, how do you address that? Can we can we bring them along with this scenario and 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 keep the door open to their concerns? Uh, I guess that's that's the question. I guess if we go back, oops, sorry, to this one, because it's simpler. I mean, the idea here is to develop a series of scenarios, not one, right? So there's the, scenario, there's the business as usual scenario. So I think that the, the job, I mean, if I think of it in terms of the job of scientists involved in this, or agencies, is to develop these scenarios and say, here's the different possibilities to give them the best information we have, here's the uncertainty about them, then it's a political process. There's no two ways about it, but at least we're sketching out what the political process is about. Right, I agree with you. There's, there's, that's why I keep saying it's about resolving trade-offs. There are these trade-offs. Now, we've been doing this largely at the local level because that's where, the, that's where the most success is, that's where you can think through the, the situation. And at that level, you can usually sort it out. I mean, I have been really very pleasantly surprised because, for example, you know, who's the bad guy at the local level? The developer, right? If you're doing environmental stuff, who are the nasties? Well, in the work we've been doing here on Naturally, they've been incredibly helpful and incredibly interested in what they could do and still do their development even though it might be costly or a little different, and how they could market that to people. And, and you know, we've developed scenarios where um, the Huron natural area is an amenity. And you explain to people buying there, well, you're, you're, the landscape, you're, the subdivision is going to look a little different, and there are some different rules attached to it, but that's because here's what it's going to do for you. Right? And they've been extremely receptive to that. So, I mean, that's left me optimistic that at least in the situations we've been in, we've been able to build scenarios and build situations where the quote-unquote environmental bad guy actually doesn't want to be a bad guy and does some really positive stuff. In the village in Kenya, the one overhead I had up with the spaghetti diagram, the bad guys were the railway engineers because they were causing runoff that was wiping out the road. right? But when the community went to them and said, here's what we want to do, you know, you're the source, well, they said, you're the source of the problem, and they said, no, we're not, blah, blah, blah. What happened in that dialogue is the railway engineers saw a way that they could fix the problem, that they could work with the village and make it work, because they always blamed it on the village. Right? They, were all, they were doing this, basically. And what happened is the railway engineers volunteered their time to do a set of things to improve the drainage patterns in the village and off the railroad that resulted in the road being an all-year road. So they incorporated, I mean, it's bringing them to the table and getting them involved in the dialogue at least in the situations we've been in, and I'm not being naive here about how difficult it is with the one you're talking about, they've seen a way they can, be, they can do their thing and be positive players. And if you can create that situation, and I'm sure there are situations where you know, push comes to shove and you're just like this and it's a political decision, right? But if you can get them to be positive, see a way they can be positive players in the situation, people want to do that. Right? So that's my note of optimism. <laughs> For that, and we've been successful in doing that in local situations. You know, I, I think there are ways the, the, the petroleum industry, I mean, I think they're starting to think hydrogen, they're starting to think other things, that they can see ways they can do it. But we're not sitting down and having the dialogue and the collaborative, you know, putting together the collaborative learning system that lets people work together and sort out their resolutions and discuss it. I am uh, Jeff Oliver in the Economics Group in Environment Canada. Um, you often find people locked into sort of certain 
uh, patterns of thinking uh, frameworks they, they uh, are particularly uh, beholden to. Uh, you'll find the economists who talk about the innate wisdom of the market and the ineffectiveness of uh, government and trying to make interventions into uh, into that system. And on the other hand, you'll also find um, a lot of uh, people uh, on the environmental persuasion who sort of say there's an innate wisdom in nature that we uh, sort of uh, intervene at our peril. Um, and I'm just wondering, with that second perspective, where your sort of thinking would stand in terms of the idea of that there we shouldn't be um, pushing nature too hard because it's sort of evolved over a period of time to create a sustainable environment for us and we're now doing massive experiments and pushing the systems in ways we don't understand versus another perspective which I've seen is sort of have come out in your presentation which is what well, we're doing it anyway um, and uh, it's not all that big a deal. Um, but, you know, I think when we think about climate change and ice ages uh, and, and, you know, big ocean current flips, we do think it's a big deal. So there's sort of a weird kind of ambivalence. I'm uh, interested in your comments on that. Sorry, you asked two questions. What was the, the first one was about disciplines, right? Well, no, it was just it was a context setting, just sort of saying that there are people who sort of feel that nature is, um, you know, that something is, 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 is taboo. You shouldn't touch the economic, you shouldn't touch the marketplaces because we, it's, it's too, uh, it's subtle and sophisticated and we don't understand yeah. it, so leave it alone. Nature's the same way. Well, it's interesting because people, when they're reacting that way, you know, from their disciplinary mindset, they've got an abstraction they're dealing with, the world that they frame. If you then take them, what I found is when you take them and deal with an actual situation on the ground, and when I say situation, I mean a landscape that you're dealing with, right? Not uh, saying the problem is education. The problem is the village wants to improve its life, or the city of Kishner wants to improve its, its, its life and then get people to sit and talk about it from that point of view, then they frame the world in a different way. It's automatic in that. So that's, that's the first issue we're getting at. The second one is, yeah, you're right about the ambivalence, right? On the one hand, I'm scared silly. And I'm scared silly because I look at the climate change stuff and I look at the people I talk to, and the possibility of there being a flip in the very near future in the climate is very real. All the signs are there that I would expect. The first thing you, the, the, the major sign you get before a flip is the system starts to oscillate wildly about its means, right? And we're seeing 100-year events that are, that are happening with a regularity that makes them no longer 100-year events, right? The tornado that just went through the University of Maryland, for example, is without precedent. Those are the signs you expect to see before a system flips. Right, half the half the ice. The, sorry, the, the the mean ice thickness in the Arctic is now one half of what it was 30 years ago. Right? I mean, those are just that's a hard fact. So that there's changes occurring. I mean, on the other hand, you have to be optimistic and try and do deal with it as best you can, and presume that you can do things that are going to make it work. So that's the I think that's the dichotomy you're seeing. So we're trying to say, okay, how can, how, can we do, how can we go about doing things in a more constructive way that'll help things work? And also, you're also talking local versus global. I mean, the things that frighten me are at the big scale, and I tend to work at the local scale where things are more manageable. So there's, that's part of the ambivalence you're seeing, is the scale difference, right? Does that help, or does that? No, well, it just uh, I think we're all grappling with the same issues. Yeah. I, thought that, I think the ambivalence is there in, in all of us in terms yeah. of, uh, wanting to uh, get a sense that we can intervene, but having a real sense that we don't have the knowledge base to really know what we're doing, on, especially on the global right. level. Thanks. Yeah, no, I know my, my colleague Schneider, who I wrote with quite a bit, who was chief scientist at NOAA in the early 90s, I mean, in, in 95, he packed up, moved to Montana, and has his six, 600 acres at 6,000 feet and doesn't talk to the world anymore. Because he came to the conclusion, we're just, re I mean, what he said to me is, we're just rearranging the... the the deck chairs on the Titanic. So I just so I mean you, you can respond to this as you wish. <laughs> I mean, that was the chief scientist at the, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. If we are the existence of sense uh, branch, uh, I have a specific question about uh, Lake Erie. I was interested uh, by the fact you mentioned the the pelagic state of Lake Erie and uh, the fact that he could, uh, the system was at this ability to extract nutrients from the bottom, you know, from mm -hmm. the sediments. And I was interested by, by that 
because um, I was surprised. Usually, I don't know uh, totally Lake Erie, but usually you have thermal stability, you know, in lakes during the summer, and it creates a barrier to the migration of nutrients from the bottom, so it cannot reach the epidemic. Yeah. You notice I said shallow lakes. Shallow lakes. And the definition of shallow is that doesn't happen. Okay. That, that's, the, uh, that's actually the key point. If that happens, you're right, then you're into a very different dynamic. Mm -hmm. And so there's a ratio, I don't know if you know the Wolheiner um, diagram, but there's a ratio of the physical area of the lake to the depth of the lake and, and, and the, the topography that, that has to do with these turnover situations. Yeah. And so you're absolutely right, but that's a different kind of lake thing. Okay. So, so basically, the, if there's thermal stability in the lake area, it's not very important or? Well, actually, I mean, if we're... It gets a lot more complicated. Okay. Because Lake Erie is actually three separate Basin, yeah. basins, right? And there are different things going on in the different basins. And Henry, and I, Henry Regeer and I wrote a paper where we talked, worked through these dynamics as best we could given the information we had. But you have to deal with the three different basins separately. Okay. So what I said here was a, it was a coarse description of the, what was going on. Although th w the whole lake did sink. You know, what we think happens is, is that if there's not people around the lake, you're in a, 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 a quote-unquote natural situation, you've actually got patchy dynamics going on and the different areas behaving differently. But because the input that we have overwhelmed all those dynamics and, and synced the entire thing. So it's like when you do, it's, it's exactly the same phenomenon as when you manage forest fires. Right? If you don't have a forest, if you're not managing forest fires, you have this patchy mosaic on the landscape. But then when you manage it, you get this everything in the same state. And that's what we think happened in Lake Erie. Whereas normally, or naturally, whatever phrase you want to use, you would expect it to be this patchy dynamic. So if you want to get Lake Erie back to where it was, you need to restore that, that patchiness as we're doing with the, the forest fire management regimes. So it's the same idea. But your point's right. Thank you. Okay. Dean Stinson O'Gorman, uh, the Economic and Regulatory Affairs Directorate here, and uh, very nice talk, of course, I've seen versions of it at least a couple of times in the past, and uh, uh, really enjoy it. Um, I, I, I think you have two messages, or there's two different kind of components, and I want to make a comment on one and ask a question about the other. The first part of what you're describing to us is complex systems and getting a better sense of how we can really understand what complexity is and how systems behave. And I'll point out, and I've mentioned this to you earlier, and just to, it bears repeating, I think, that a lot of people, when they think about complexity, think about you know the stuff they do at the Santa Fe Institute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think your, what, how you're approaching systems and complex systems is coming from a slightly different place. It's the, the lineage of systems theory and von Burtonfli and von Neumann and these guys. Um, and where the complexity arises as a result of just how many different interactions there are at many different levels of the system. Uh, just to point out, as, as you know, uh, and as you're somewhat critical of, uh, there's a different approach of complex systems, which is specifically about how the complex behavior that you can describe at one level of your system arises from uh, what looks very complex, but it actually arises from fairly simple decision rules from agents operating at a lower level in the hierarchy, and the, that's where the emergent behavior arises. Um, and that line of research has a is offering some very interesting new ways of thinking. I think there's areas to integrate the two. So I just wanted to point that out, that there's a slightly different use of complexity. But here's my question to you. Um, the second part of your talk is about uh, how do we use this and for ecosystem management. And you, right. the graph is very nice. How would you compare that to a different approach that a lot of people put forward, which is a broad risk analysis, risk assessment, risk management kind of framework, which is where people are trying to determine what the uncertainties are for the different kind of risks that we face as a society. You know, there's kind of a, the literature, you know, lays it out pretty clearly in terms of how a, a very broad perspective on managing risk would be done to deal with ecosystems. And then you design risk management framework to try and deal with stakeholders. How different or similar is that to, I think your, what you're proposing is different. And I'd like you to try and elucidate yeah, a bit. Yeah, it's, it's, you're right, it is different and it is similar. Um, one of the major differences is the risk assessment people tend to take a, dis a particular disciplinary perspective. They 
they don't generally, and I mean, I have to be very careful here because you can't paint everybody with the same brush, but one of the major differences here is you sit down and try and figure out from the point of view and with the stakeholders, what this, what's a valid system description? And that's the first step. And then what are the issues of concern to people? So that establishes a framing of the situation that then you can apply risk ideas to, risk analysis to. Right? But most of the work I see doesn't do that first step that frames the situation in a particular way. They just assume a framing to begin with. One of our students um, did a master's thesis where he looked at the, the debate over Alcor, and he looked at the different players and the different reports that were done and the different risk, they were all risk assessments, right, that came to very different conclusions about whether you should or should not use Alcor. <laughs> But he took it the one step back and said, what was the system they were dealing with? What was their abstraction of the world that they used to do the analysis? When you did that, you saw that each of the reports had a fundamentally different system description that were incompatible. And so, the re I mean, so given that you have an incompatible system description to begin with, you're going to have incompatible results. It just logically follows. They won't make, they won't make sense. They're not talking about the same, I mean, they're literally not talking about the same thing. Right, so there's that very important first step of, of sorting out what the system description is. The other thing in, is in risk, you can, if you want, use the notion of attractors and self-organization, but generally it's not. It's an incremental worldview that's used. Right, so that's not there. Right, interestingly enough, I mean, Fundowitz and Ravitz, who've done most of the, the work on trying to push this forward epistemologically and philosophically and, and invented this notion of post-normal science, they came from the risk assessment area. That's what they were working in, and that's what they've written about before they got into these set of ideas. So it was, it was from their own internal critique of risk assessment that led them to do this. So does risk assessment fit in? Yes. Can you set up risk assessment processes so they work this way? Yes. Do some people do that? Yes. <laughs> but the vast majority don't because they miss the complexity issue and they miss the how do you frame the situation issue to begin with. Does that sort of give you some so sense? The incremental world you commented. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But to go back to Santa Fe for a second, I mean, you have to be very careful. I mean, everybody talks about the Santa Fe thing. The interesting thing is that that group of people who we call the Santa Fe Institute, Stu Kaufman and that crew, aren't there anymore. Haven't been there for about five years. Santa Fe reinvented itself and said, no, 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 we don't want to be doing this. It's quite an interesting dynamic. But they're dealing with the consequences of complication as versus complexity. And they're seeing complexity emerge from a lot of complicated interactions. But they're not, deal as you said, they're not dealing with the systems issues. So it's very powerful and useful in a whole set of circumstances, but it's only part of the complexity story. It's an important part of the complexity story, but it's not anywhere near the whole story. It's a part of the story. And what I'm talking about today is part of the story as well, because I didn't talk at all about cellular automata and the computer modeling, or I didn't talk about the thermodynamics, really. So it is part of the story. But I think a situation that I would characterize as, com as complex, though, has those three things, irreducible uncertainty, <coughs> multiple attractors, and you need a hierarchical description. I think those three things are at the kernel of what makes something a complex situation. Hi, Tracy Burton from Environment Canada. On one hand, I think we accept that uh, biological systems are dynamic, and you showed us today also that they're complex, but those complexities can be understood. So in your example of your Southern Ontario uh, watershed, um, the question I have is, so we're looking at these systems in a snapshot in time. Right. And so um, these, as you mentioned before about, um, you know, these could be he historical or whatever, and what exists now is a product of that. But is it, how do you deal with, for example, the time frame? So let's say in 20 years or 50 years, if there's some kind of long term uh, st strategy there for maintaining this. And that sort of brings me back to the idea about what the goals are, I suppose, and how, how well, I mean, we say predictive factors again, I guess, but can you use this? Uh, what you're saying and your strategies. Or do you have to go back every few years and then reassess what you've studied or look at different uh, inputs at that time? Sorry, I'll show you something that answers this. Um, I mean, first off, yes, you, the, the point is it has to be an ongoing process. So we wrote a master plan for the Huron Natural Area. The master plan was not prescriptive about you're going to do this, these interventions. The master plan was framing the situation, setting up the institutional governance structure, 
and the monitoring structure so that you'd have this ongoing process of evaluation and working through and learning about the system. So you frame it that way. So you're always looking at what's going on and doing it. Now, I'll show you something for the Huron Natural Area. If I can just get these up, that's really, when we, and it's about those goals things. When we first got into this, our thought about it was, well, we want to preserve this remnant, right? Now, we're very fortunate because of two things. One, there's a, a woman, and her families have lived on the site for a long, 150 years. There was a woman who, and I'm not even sure she's still alive, but she was in her 90s when she gave this to us. She had a folio about this thick of photographs and line drawings and stuff that went back to the, about 1870 of what was happening on this site from 1870. So we had that resource. The other thing is we had air photos from um, uh, 1940 something. But I'll just show you those. Okay, here we go. Here's 46. Here's what the landscape looks like today, right? Whoops, go back here. Well, we're going in the wrong direction. Sorry. Okay, so there's the boundaries of the natural area now, right? Here's the air. This is all that existed in 1946. And all the rest of it, all this, this color here is agricultural land. So it actually wasn't a natural area remnant. It was agricultural land. And if you watch the air photos over time, right, it builds back in. Right? What we discovered is, and, and looking at the, talking to people from the area, is the wetland that's there um, is twice as big as it was because somebody put a culvert in to change the drainage patterns because he wanted more wetland. Um, most of this entire area here and this entire area here has all been rehabilitative work that's been done by individuals over the last 50 years. So we're looking at it today saying, hmm, looks like something we should preserve. And then we discover that actually it's a rehabilitated landscape that was mostly agricultural land in the 40s. It totally changed our, our perspective and goals about it by having that, that temporal data. When we were doing the Lake Erie stuff, we, I mean, you need to go back two, three hundred years. We tried to, there are some people who've looked at some of the diaries that were kept in the 1700s and 1800s, and we tried to draw on that resource when we were going through it. But yeah, when you're dealing with these things, you need long, what we consider long-term data. You're on natural, you need at least a hundred years to understand what was going on there. The lakes, you probably need 300 years. It's a huge challenge. So that, but that's the kind of ignorance, I mean, that's uncertainty and ignorance as well, but it's a different kind. It's the kind that in principle you can deal with, right? You just need information. Got time for another one? Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. My question was relating to um, basically what you were just saying. I was wondering about the reverse and whereby you the society decides to do some um, environmental engineering to actually induce some flips. And has there been much work done on that and on the social implications of repercussions of that destabilizing a larger system? I think that's the frontier we're at. I mean, those are exactly the questions that come out that you need to think about. We are doing it at a huge scale, right? I mean, we're screwing around with the climate system. But nobody's really thought that through. It's not been done consciously, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah, they haven't. And then the next question is, if you start doing it consciously, what does that look like? How do you do it? How do, what are the methodologies? Well, they could do research to uh, figure out what another stable state might be in that system that might right. be better for us. Yeah. Could be useful for uh, planetary terraforming as well. Yeah. I mean, there, there are people thinking about exactly those issues. I mean, that's what the whole Biosphere 2 project, which you know, there were lots of problems with, but that's what it's evolved into now. There's a set of very, you know, what I consider to be very serious scientists, I'm making all sorts of value judgments here, but who are now use, asking those kind of questions and trying to explore that as an open system and using it as a, a platform for thinking, trying to think those kind of things through. So yeah, those are some of the big questions that come up. You got time for one more. I'm, I, you probably will talk about this later anyway, but I am not clear about the difference between 
monitoring, management, and governance. Particularly, I can understand what a governor on a steam engine is and how it lets off a bit of pressure every once in a while and keeps the thing from, from exploding. And so I can understand how monitoring and, and you know, and, and then management you, or governance, either one, you respond to what you're, what you're observing and you take appropriate action. But how do you see, how could you characterize the difference between management and governance? That, that's what's not clear in my mind. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I'll give you some, I, if I could do it by example, perhaps. Mm -hmm. If you think about the Huron natural area and this issue of the beaver and the trout stream, I mean, the, the managers capture the they take the steps to make sure the beaver get trapped and removed, right? The governance people had to decide, are we going to have trout or are we going to have beaver? Once they've made that decision, somebody's got to take the steps to make it reality, right? And the people who do the monitoring would be then monitoring to see, you know, where are the beaver? Are they coming in? Should we be expecting them? How's the trout stream doing? What's the quality of it, right? Which feeds back into the governance people. Do we need to be rethinking this? You know, there's a set of people in this situation who argue that the trout stream can't be kept anyway. It's just, you just can't do it. So, uh, you know, we'll have to see how that unfolds. I'm, I'm sort of ambivalent one way or the other with respect to the trout stream. I'm not sure it's reasonable to keep it. And I, we'll just have to see how that plays out. But the monitoring will tell us how that's playing out. Right? Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Steve Blight from uh, Environmental Economics Branch. I got two questions. First one's kind of technical and probably simple for you to answer, and the second one is much of a higher level, at a much higher level. The first one is in your double pendulum example. Uh, is there something inherent in the system of that double pendulum that makes it uh, chaotic or complex? In that, if you start from precisely the same conditions, that it that it still won't do the same thing? Or is it really just because of you can't get the initial conditions exactly the same? So that's, that's the, the first question. I mean, is there something inherent in the system that no matter if you were able to get the uh, initial conditions precisely the same, then it would, would it or would it not do the same thing? The second question is, uh, as you talk to people in groups like this and why, other... Why don't we do the first one first, because I'll okay. forget it. Sure, before I get to the second one. Um, the double pendulum situation is about reality as versus abstract models. Now, that double pendulum was constructed by a set of students who sat down with computer models and sorted out lengths and weights and stuff that would maximize its, um, its sensitivity to the initial conditions. Okay, so yeah, it's at some levels a deliberate cheat, right? But you can get that sucker down to, you know, hair width, hair widths in terms of, or even finer control than that, and it still won't be predictable because it's so sensitive to initial conditions. So then you get into the problem of background noise, you know, truck driving by, et cetera. I mean, you can't eliminate the background noise. And that's the thing about chaotic systems is that it's when does the noise overwhelm your initial conditions? That's the sort of technical issue you get into. In this particular situation, we deliberately designed something so that the background noise would overwhelm the initial conditions. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't, you could, you could try and put it right back, but you know the truck, the people walking down the road or something are going to set up vibrations or a truck driving by that are going to swamp right. the behavior of the system. So that's the the technical side of it. And I mean, if you take that argument to its logical extreme, you end up with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? I mean, you, you've always got that wall. If you, if you do the mental experiment of, well, let's take the vibrations out, let's do it as best you can, you've always got that uncertainty wall, the uncertainty principle. So that's the first one. Okay. Second one, as you talk to groups of people like us and other people, and uh, as you work on a, both a, a quite a local scale, and it sounds like you're working in a, a macro scale on the climate change, how far do you think the, the ideas and the concepts around uh, complex theories are, are kind of infiltrating into the body politic and the way we deal with things and the way we... Uh, in other words, what kind of progress are you making in, in, uh, in uh, preaching or in, in talking to people and getting them to think the same way? Yeah, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, you know. On the one hand, and it's, I mean, if you look at the history of the revolution of scientific thought, this is always the case. 
on the one hand, I've been shocked at how fast the change has been happening, right? Because if you look, let me just pull up another. I don't know if this one has it or not. <laughs> Yeah, if you look at the National Science Foundation in the United States, they've established a new directorate called Environmental Research and Education, right? And um, their major program is biocomplexity, which is what I've been talking about today. They're spending in the order of $100 million a year funding biocomplexity research, and that directorate um, is responsible for a billion dollars a year in research funding. Right? And I find myself chairing the, the committee that's responsible for preparing a strategic plan for that directorate. What are you gonna, what's environmental research and education going to look like in the United States? So on the one hand, that's very, <laughs> very positive, right? On the other hand, it, you can't underestimate the change in mindset that's involved and the institutional changes. I mean, I've found consistently the biggest problem in all, at all scales is institutional even in, in a university. Uh, universities aren't set up to deal with interdisciplinary work. Funding agencies think about disciplines. Um, you know, government agencies are organized, you know, the hydrologists sit over here and the soils people sit over there and the biologists sit over there and they're just not organized properly to make this work. So it's an incredible institutional struggle. On the other hand, you see signs of this thing doing that flip that happens in science. It's, it's really amazing how quickly it's happening. But then, then you've got the tension as one of my, getting co-opted by the old school and, and then it just being the same old stuff but a new name. I mean, that's one of the things with the biocomplexity program that's really tricky is you have, you know, you've got a pot with $100 million and you've got a lot of researchers coming forward. But are they actually talking about biocomplexity or are they dressing up the same old stuff so that it looks like biocomplexity? So those are the, that's what's playing out right now, and I think it's going to play out over the next decade. And I'm, I just, I don't know how that's going to play out. It's going to be interesting. But it is playing out. Hi, I just, uh, Anne Kerr, Environment Canada. I had a, a question regarding indicators. We've been developing and reporting on environmental indicators for climate change for, for a while, and we one of them is uh, looking at the change in temperature over time, and we've got a fairly, fairly long, a period, n nothing like the thousands of years we, we would like to have, but, and we've been looking at um, yearly averages for Canada and for the globe, and, and it really bounces around like this, and then we've been looking at uh, five-year averages or something to try and smooth the trend to see, in fact, if there's increases over time. But in talking with uh, our, one of our former directors, Tom Bridges, you probably know, and others, you know, we're wondering whether we shouldn't, we're really, that's only one perspective as you're talking about, and we really ought to be looking at at the amplitude of the of the of the bouncing around and the frequency of of that bouncing around, because maybe that is a precursor for for some of these flips uh, that you're talking about. And I just wonder if you could comment on that. Yep. Um, back in the early '90s, when uh, Eric Schneider was chief scientist at NOAA, and as you know, NOAA looks after National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, he was responsible for all high level high latitude global climate change research in the United, that was done in the United States. And we had a lot of discussions about this. And at the time, he was trying to push these ideas in that community without luck, right? Without that, I think that's why he packed his bags, literally, at one point in frustration. We sat down, we asked exactly that question, what do you want to look at, right? And he said, look, I've got all the data that's been collected on temperature all over the world. He, he managed to get his hands on all the Soviet data. So he had everything. He says, how do we analyze this? And so we sat down, and because it's about variabilities, it's about was yesterday hot and today cold, not what the mean does. Because yesterday could be hot, and today could be cold, and the mean doesn't change. Right? That's the problem. And so we said, okay, how do you look at that? And, and I, had a, I have a fair bit of training in that kind of analysis, and nothing came to mind. So I went... You know, it's Waterloo, right? Biggest math faculty on the planet. We have the most undergraduate mathematics students on the planet and some of the very best thinkers in mathematics and in, and in systems engineering. So I sort of went around shopping around all the people I know presenting this problem and everybody went, hmm, hadn't thought about that. There is no statistical tool, is what I discovered. There is no methodology 
for looking at that variability because looking at deviation, you know, standard deviations or mo statistical moments doesn't tell you what you want to know. You want to know if today was cold, is tomorrow going to be hot? You know, how often am I going to have 50 year events? Because <laughs> they're not 50 year events anymore. The tools aren't there. That's what we discovered in the mid 90s. Now, I haven't checked since, but there were not tools to do the analysis on the data that you wanted to do. So it turned out to be an interesting problem in mathematics, at which point I went on to other things. <laughs> But you see what I'm saying? It's it, it, it's a real challenge. It's not even quite clear how you pose the question, right? Yeah. Oh. Uh, Ole Hendrickson Biodiversity Convention Office. I've got to give a talk to some foresters about old growth forests and data gaps and challenges for understanding old growth. And this is almost the total opposite of what you're talking about here. Here's a system that just sits there and is a powerful attractor, doesn't doesn't change, maybe evolves a little bit. And, and people have a strong emotional uh, yeah. uh, uh, attraction as well to these things. And we're trying to keep that part aside and just look at this scientifically. And, and But these things, of course, don't exist outside a broader landscape context. And at some point, there's a flip. But what uh, do you, uh, I guess I'm being selfish here, but what, what would I say to the, the scientists about what we need to do to really understand old growth forests? Let me just see. I think I killed it. <coughs> Slide for everything. Have you, um, I don't know if you've seen Holling's work on the yeah, four box yeah, model. I mean, yeah. that's the dynamic that's going on in the old growth forests. They're not static systems. They're actually very active systems. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that, that for me is you can't think of them as a stable climax community anymore. You have to think about it in this way, in terms of that four box and that shifting steady state mosaic and how do you, the, the system's really very dynamic. How do you maintain that dynamicism and the, re, the, the reason it's there is because of the resiliency. Right? The reason it's there is because of that ability to keep going through this cycle on an ongoing basis. And what we've done with fire suppression is, you know, chop the cycle right about there. Right? So that, I mean, I guess for me, that's the message. It's, you have mm -hmm. to think about it as this dynamic, shifting, steady state mosaic. And you've got to understand what builds the resiliency into the system that maintains it there. It's not a stable thing just sitting. So that's, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to return to Anne's question for one second, because one of the things I found with this is we find ourselves posing questions of situations, like the, the one you did about temperature and what do you do with it. When you use this kind of methodology and start asking questions of the situation, you discover the, the profound holes in our science. I mean, that, that question identifies a profound hole in our ability to analyze data sets. The, the statistics, the statistical techniques just aren't there. And that's what I find happening all the time, which for me, you know, as an academic, that's exciting. You find whole areas that we don't know about. On the other hand, they're not areas that, the, because they've never been identified, the funding agencies don't fund them. So it's a chicken and egg problem. You can't do, you can't do that work. That's why we didn't pursue it, because we couldn't find anybody who saw it as their purview to fund that activity because nobody was thinking about those issues. So, but it's, it's interesting because we keep identifying issues that we just don't have, we don't know how to do and that we need to know how to do. I actually have a burning question that I've, I've been holding for a couple of minutes. I think it's a quick one. Um, when you look at the very second to last slide you put up in your first presentation, you had a number of uh, changes. I think it was, so what changes? Um, that one? That one, yeah. And when, when I look at that slide, I think I almost think of your flip from one system to another. But I also think, um, you know, what what would cause that flip? But but more practically speaking, I, what would that system look like? Is it simply a more it's holistic the talk? <laughs> okay, but it, I guess I just wanted to kind of plant that seed. Yeah. a more holistic view of doing things with essentially the same number of bodies, same split between scientists, economists, lawyers, you know, or is it? 10 times the size and a completely different organization. No, actually, I mean, that's an interesting way of putting it. I mean, first off, you asked, you know, what's going to cause the flip? Well, what's causing the flip is people's frustration that they're not getting anywhere. I mean, that's what we find constantly. That's what drove us to it in the first place, was looking at it and saying, 
these traditional approaches just aren't working. We have, you know, there's something, we gotta think outside the box. And that's what gets people involved in this, right? That's what's triggering the flip, okay? The other thing is, I mean, it's an interesting, I hadn't thought about it that way, but no, the, you don't have a whole larger set of players. It's how they're interconnected to each other that changes. Right, so when we're doing the Huron Natural Area, yeah, it's, you know, it's the same ministries, the same agencies that would normally be involved in looking at it, except they're sitting, they're in a different institutional structure. So they're sitting at a table together, coming together once a month. So we had a steering committee that did, did the Huron Natural Area. That steering committee had the mayor sitting on it, the head of the two school boards, the Ministry of Natural Resources, the senior person in our area, Grand River Conservation Authority, from the university, you know, a set of players who came to the table. Now, one of the things, I mean, it was a standing joke at the, at the monthly meeting that the chair had to get the two school board chairs to shut up, you know, call the class to order, stop talking in class, then you'd stand up and say, because they never had an opportunity to sit down together because of the institutional structures. So there was actually a whole bunch of political business in the city that got done at these meetings that had nothing to do with the Huron Natural Area. Both, be, you know, there would be this caucus for half an hour before and at least an hour afterwards of the people because they never have an opportunity to sit together. And they said that was one of the things for them that was really revolutionary about the Huron Natural Area and the way we were approaching it is that people sat at the same table and talked. I mean, the, I mean, the mayor, the head of planning, the head of engineering, the head of the two school boards coming every month, there had to be a reason. You know, and that, and that was the reason. So same players as well as the community, right, but a different agenda and a different way of going about it. Thanks. I'd like to invite uh, Bill Jarvis, Director General of the Policy Research Director, to come up and thank Professor Kay. As he's walking to the podium, let me do a quick plug for our next event, which is uh, taking place on December 7th in the same room with uh, Dan Esty, Professor of Law at Yale, who's going to be talking about the World Economic Forum Environmental Sustainability Index, December 7th, same time, same place. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. It's, uh, it truly is uh, both a pleasure and a privilege uh, to uh, be up here to thank uh, Professor Kay. Uh, we started these uh, prestigious speaker series uh, here at Environment Canada in order to bring in uh, some ideas from, from outside the department and to uh, create some intellectual development and, and leadership in the department. And, and to start the process, of converting uh, ideas uh, that uh, flow around our society uh, into the kind of material that we can make uh, new and, and better, more robust environmental policy about. Uh, I think uh, we've had a, a terrific example today of the introduction of uh, ideas that uh, really have a, a, a profound ring for a lot of the stuff that we're doing at Environment Canada. Uh, our challenge remains to convert this uh, challenging, provocative, sometimes scary, sometimes optimistic view of the world into, uh, into mechanisms that we can actually use in terms of, of public policy. So on behalf of everybody here, Professor Kay, let me give you my very heartfelt thanks for a terrific presentation this morning. Thank you. Now, in addition to, uh, to Paul's comments about our next uh, uh, event, uh, if you like this, tell your friends and colleagues, go down the hall, ring the bell when the next one comes around, uh, because if we're going to create a new intellectual leadership in the department, uh, we need as many people as possible. So uh, hope to see you all here next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.